so welcome everybody to the Institute for Government. Uh, Happy New Year. We enter 2019 with the clock ticking down. As we know, to UK exit from the European Union, probably on the 29th of March 2019. As we will keep on reminding everybody, those oh, are the those are the de- those are the defaults uh, set in UK law at the moment, uh, unless ministers and Parliament decide to change the date. So in December, some of you will remember that we had an event entitled "After the Meaningful Vote, What Next for Brexit?" and we had to do some urgent surgery on the slide, so it just became what next for Brexit after not the meaningful vote. Um, But finally, uh, on Tuesday, we had the cathartic moment when MPs could finally give their first verdict on the Prime Minister's deal, and we've all seen that that verdict was a pretty resounding no. So I think it's a really interesting time to be asking our panel or what's happening next. So I'm really delighted that we're being joined by distinguished MPs, both members of the Exiting the EU Committee. Uh, and on that side, uh, commentators uh, and business representatives. So I'm just going to run through our panel, and then we'll turn to them very quickly. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jill Rutter. I'm Programme Director for our work on Brexit at the Institute for Government. And if you want to join the conversation, please tweet like mad from hashtag IFG Brexit. So, on my immediate left, we have Joanna Cherry QC. Uh, Joanna's the MP for Edinburgh South West uh, since May 2015, and she's the Scottish National Party spokesman for Justice and Home Affairs. We all know that the SNP are potentially big players in what's going forward, both in Westminster and also uh, up in Edinburgh, and that Ian Blackford did agree to see the Prime Minister last night. Uh, never. Delighted to be joined by the Right Honourable Stephen Crabb, MP for Priscilla, Pembrokeshire, uh, which my colleague Joe Owen points me out is on the Welsh Riviera, which is where Joe loves to holiday in his caravan. Uh, he's a former Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, uh, former Secretary of State for Wales, former Government Whip, and is in that very interesting and quite elite category of Conservative MPs who voted for the Prime Minister's deal but didn't have to because they weren't on the payroll. Um, and so we're going to ask Stephen what he thinks happens next. Then to my immediate right, we have Ian Dale, who all of you will know is one of the UK's top broadcasters with a daily show on London Broadcasting, who no, I think... No, 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 not London anymore. It's national. Doesn't LBC start? No, leading Britain's conversation. Is it? <laughs> so out of date, John. OK. <laughs> It's LBC, whatever. Anyway, uh, Ian has been uh, camped out on College Green with a never-ending stream of distinguished politicians through his tent and in desperate moments, people like me. Uh, anyway, and a uh, uh, former managing director of Bite Back and a, still a committed Leave supporter. Uh, so he's going to tell us what he thinks uh, should happen next if the Prime Minister is going to uh, survive, scrabble through how the UK should leave. And finally, delighted to be joined by Ali Renison, who lots and lots of you will know as the very high profile head of European trade policy at the Institute of Directors, uh, previously previously advised parliamentarians on trade and employment policy areas. And I think suffice to say that the IOD wasn't wild about what happened on Tuesday night. Uh, Her director issued a statement Uh, The headline is, business leaders call out collective failures of politicians as we stare down the barrel of no deal. So give me our panel, I'm going to put one or two questions to them first, then we'll go to you for questions and make it all a very interactive session, and we will definitely end by 9.45. Any of you in the room who are civil servants, please remember we are live streaming this, so take that into account if you are framing your questions. in a way that you won't regret when you get back to Whitehall, because we published a report yesterday on churn in Whitehall, saying it was a bad thing, so we don't want to contribute to any more of that. Uh, So, (laughs) Stephen, let me start with you. You supported the Prime Minister's deal. It ran into a brick wall. The Sun had a picture of the deal of the Prime Minister grafted onto a dodo body yesterday. Do you think the Prime Minister's deal is dead, or is there life in the deal yet? I don't think the deal is dead, and the reason I say that is because um, you you need two parties to the deal, and on one side is the EU, and they are still adamant that this is the deal that they're willing to make with 
the UK if the U UK wants a negotiated exit from the EU. Now, it may well be that there is room for some further discussions, uh, further assurances, maybe even some ch amendments to some of the text. But in terms of the fundamentals of the deal, including the, the Irish backstop, <coughs> The EU, and they were solid on this yesterday, the early responses from e EU leaders following the, the vote on Tuesday night, they are not going to reopen this. If the UK wants a negotiated exit with a deal, this is the deal that's on, on the table. So that's why I say I don't think the deal is dead. On the other side, if you're asking me, do I think that Parliament, the, the, a coalition of pragmatic centre-ground MPs can be forged to pass this deal, given the overwhelming defeat on Tuesday night, I'm profoundly pessimistic about that. And if you ask me then what happens next, I'm not sure. Okay, I was going to ask you what happens, what happens next. Do you think the Prime Minister has been right to make a sort of first move, this sort of invitation to the other party leaders to come in and talk to her? And is she going about that in the right way? Uh, she absolutely has to do that. Um, that, that was a given, given what happened on Tuesday night. Um, if there's any chance that... Look, there is a majority in the House of Commons against leaving without a deal. Therefore, you need a deal. If, there's, if you're going to have any chance at all of passing a deal, and the answer I gave you a few moments ago suggests that the deal is the one that the EU has been um, talking about, then she's going to have to reach out and find votes from across the other side of the chamber. So yes, it's given that she has to do that. Um, is she going about it the right way? Um, look, we're at the very, very early stages of that. Yes, the, and I think one of the newspaper reports I read, I think in the Times yesterday, suggests that David Lidington has been mm. tasked with the job of managing some of these cross-party mm. discussions. Well, he's exactly the right kind of individual with this, all of the experience of working in Europe, but with a lot of the personal qualities, who understands nuances and can reach out and work with MPs from different parties. So he's the right person to be involved in that. Whether the Prime Minister herself ha has got the level of trust across the House and has got the range of personal qualities required to forge a consensus given the deep, deep divisions and mm. tribal hostilities that exist in the Commons, I don't know. She needs other people working with her, which mm. is why I'm encouraged that um, one of those reports suggests that David Liddington would be playing a leading role. So, Joanna, Ian Blackford was yeah. one of the people having uh, maybe drinks, I don't know, with the Prime Minister. Um, have you had a readout from what happened at that meeting I've last not, night? I've not, I've not spoken to Ian yet, but um, I think that the essential problem Theresa May has is that she's left reaching out cross-party mm. to a very late stage in the proceedings. And also, there's no meaningful compromise unless she's prepared to relax her red lines. And she was asked about that several times mm. yesterday during the course of the debate. Mm. And surprisingly, we didn't get a straight answer, but I didn't get the impression that she's prepared to relax any of her red lines. I think the deal is dead, and this is why I think it's dead. The essential reason that deal was so heavily defeated comes down to cro cross-party opposition to it. But the real problem for the DUP and the ERG mm. is the backstop. And the European mm. Union are not going mm. to budge on that. Now, after a month of faffing about, Theresa May came back with that letter of assurance. And it was quite clear when I questioned the Attorney General about that. In, in any, I'm not saying the letter of assurance has no legal weight. It may be used as a way to interpret the treaty. But in any competition between what's in the letter of assurance and what's in the treaty, the treaty will always triumph. And the DUP and the, back, and the ERG can't, le can't live with what's in the withdrawal agreement about the backstop. So I think that's why the deal is dead. There are so many reasons I don't like the deal. Uh, essentially, where the SNP are at is this. 62% of Scots voted to remain. Opinion polls show at the moment if there was another referendum, it would probably be 70%. Theresa May has cut us out of the, any negotiations from the beginning. And when I say us, mm. I don't just mean the Scottish National Party. Mm. It's important for an audience in London mm. to appreciate that in the Scottish Parliament, there is, apart from the Conservatives mm. and one rogue Lib mm. Dem, there's pretty much unity on this, on withholding consent mm. to the European Union withdrawal mm. bill. <clears throat> 
So having uh, defied the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament at every turn, it's very difficult for Theresa May to turn around at this 11th hour and expect us to sign up to some wishy-washy, watered-down version of her deal. It's just not going to happen. So where we are is we want her to admit the game's up, seek an extension of Article 50, look at the way going forward, which we think is a second referendum, we think the result, no doubt the result would be remain in Scotland. We're cautiously optimistic it would be remain in England and then get Article 50 revoked, which thanks to the case mm. I was involved in, we now know that we can do it unilaterally. Mm. So that's where, that's where we are. And if she wants to have a meaningful discussion with us, mm. she at least has to have the idea of an extension and a second vote on the table for discussion at least on the table for discussion. So one of the things that, I mean, the Prime Minister's got to come back on Monday, hasn't she, and sort of start the next stage of the process yeah. by tabling this famous motion that mm. Dominic Grieve and the Speaker have conspired to force her to do. I'm not sure that they conspired. I don't think that's quite the right word, maybe. Oh. Really. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think it depends on your view. Have facilitated uh, through facilitated. uncoordinated yeah. joint action. Um, one of the things the ex the EU committee put out a sort of quite rushed report yesterday um, was to suggest that we went to this thing called indicative mm. votes. Yeah. Do you think, Johnny, you, know, you could just explain to us how you think that might work? And actually, what would that show us? Um, you know, would people be just stick with their mm. number one option? Uh, whatever. I think the Welsh were suggesting quite an interesting thing that... I suggest it's only a bit like Strictly Come Dancing, where you sort of you know, eliminated options uh, through a sort of series of multiple votes, or like the French presidential elections, or some sort of complicated thing. So, how might indicative votes really work, and would that actually shed any light on? You know, where there might be a deal to be done in Parliament. Well, I think what we were trying to do in the report yesterday, and Stephen and I were part of the discussions that led to the report, was just to lay out what the options are and to urge Parliament now to engage with all mm. of the options, not just this deal, which has been massively voted mm. down by a huge majority in it and clearly isn't, isn't the way forward. You ask me how that's to be done, I'll be frank and say I, I, I don't have the answer to that. Mm. You know, I wouldn't pretend to be an mm. expert in the Commons procedures. I've only been an MP for mm. a short mm. period of time. It seems there's at least some question mark over to the extent to which the Speaker has uh, discretion. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, we need to, what Parliament needs to do and the Speaker needs to do responsibly is look at the fact that there's just a few mm -hmm. weeks left until, mm -hmm. um, until uh, the 29th of March. So I do want to say mm -hmm. something about that. The government and people around Theresa May are trying to give us the impression that in addition to seeking mm -hmm. the permission of, you have to get an extension, you have to get the permission of all the other mm. EU member states. But they're trying to give us the impression that it would be terribly cumbersome to, um, to deal with the fact that we've already, already got legislation saying that exit day is the 29th of March. But exit day, mm. it, it can be changed mm. by a statutory instrument, it can be changed mm. by delegated mm. legislation. So it's really not that challenging for Parliament to change the exit day. The idea that there has to be a new piece of mm. legislation and a new act mm. to go through, which seems to have got some currency, is completely wrong. And I think. Those of us who are keen to see an extension and a second vote need mm. to be articulating this. It's actually very, it's very simple matter uh, for uh, a government minister to bring forward the necessary delegated legislation, mm. if it's the will of the House, mm. uh, to seek an extension. <coughs> okay, let's... But it does have to be done by the government, though. They have to initiate it. That's the point. Indeed, but one might hope that the government would have some respect for the will of Parliament. We are a democracy, after all. <laughs> okay, moving on to Ian. Uh, so, Ian, um, yesterday I went to hear you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg, obviously a big player, chair of the European Research Group, basically saying that the Prime Minister is completely misguided to think that the answer with this scale of defeat is to bring over a bunch of Labour people. That if it was a question of you know, 30, 40, that might be a way of detaching a few, uh, few centrists and, uh, and people in Labour Leave seats who were keen to see, you know, as really Lee even weren't you know, into supporting the sort of Corbyn tactics. But with the scale of defeat, the only place she could go for a majority was to ditch the backstop and basically get the ERG and the DUP back into her camp. So that phalanx of sort of 120 plus MPs, the ERG votes and whatever, were the only route to go. Uh, do you agree that that's the sort of productive way to go? Or should she just, should, you know, basically ERG just sit there and rest on the defaults and know that actually 
all these discussions in Parliament, you know, they can happen, but actually, you know, well, in, you know, in the legislation's end, on their side. In the end, you have to learn to count, and there aren't 118 ERG members sort of willing to be persuaded to go to support mm. the Prime Minister's deal. Um, I would say there are maybe 70 or 80, but that, that, the 118 figure mm. is made up from people on, who I would describe as irreconcilables on both sides of the debate. You've got Jacob Rees-Mogg there, but you've got Dominic Grieve there. Now, people talk about the Conservative Party mm. being split in the future as if it isn't actually split already in many ways. Um, I think that... The ERG made a calculated decision this week, and, it, and I think, in a sense, they've got to be very careful what they mm. wish for, because if you support leaving the European Union on the 29th of March, you made that decision less likely mm. by your vote mm. on Tuesday. And um, it may be that if, the, if that deal or a variation of it comes back mm. before Parliament, maybe two or three mm. times before the 29th of March, that there will be some people peel mm. off. I think there were quite a few people, and had I been an MP, I, I suspect mm. I might have been one of them, who thought it was quite important to send a signal um, in the initial vote to say, well, up with this we will mm. not put. Mm. But if there's a second vote where there is a bit of variation, I, I think some people m might come round, but not 118. There's got to be some sort of significant change. And as Stephen said, mm. I don't see the European Union... I think there might be some tweaking mm. around the edges, but I don't see anything that is going to meaningfully change to make that deal any more palatable mm. to all the different pe kind of people mm. with different motivations who voted against it. So you've had a lot of MPs coming into your tent down on College Green. One of the things that people remarked on Tuesday night, that there seemed to be a palpable sense of relief among MPs, that at least they sort of had a chance to now finally give a vote. I mean, maybe this is the pent-up frustration from the postponed vote in December. And maybe now, having voted against this once, people have got that out of the system and could move on. Do you get any sense that people actually were now changing the mood a bit that now you know they said they didn't like this and that was you know that was important to them to get over that hurdle that this isn't really good enough but now people were were really looking constructively to ways forward or were people all just sort of re-entrenching around uh... well i think there is a bit of re-entrenchment re re going on actually and Let's be clear to use the word of the morning, um, which is always a word when you say that, you know that people aren't. Bit. I mean, Brandon Lewis, who's a dear friend of mine, but on the Today programme, I think he used that word at least 20 times in a 10-minute interview. And um, there, there is no clarity. There could have been clarity had this vote taken place in December. But I, I suspect the reason it didn't take place in December was that if this scale of defeat had been inflicted on the government then, Theresa May would not now be Prime Minister. I think that is quite clear. Mm -hmm. um, so where do we go from here? Uh, anybody that pretends they know is, is lying because nobody can tell where we go from here. It will be on a day-to-day -day basis. I can't see mm -hmm. the way forward for Theresa mm -hmm. May to come back with anything that Parliament would really want mm -hmm. to support on Monday. Um, her invitation to the opposition leaders, um, I mean credit to all of those who mm -hmm. have gone to see her. Um, I mean, when you have a leader of the opposition, and I know we mustn't get party political in the, these august environments, but when you have a, a leader of a party who's happy to meet Hamas and Hezbollah without preconditions, but isn't happy to meet the Prime Minister of his own country without preconditions, that tells me an awful lot. Anyway, it would be very interesting to see whether, uh, you know, who does go into Downing Street or indeed into the Cabinet Office to see David Lidington today on the Labour side, whether, you know, yes. whatever, the li liaison committee having sort of rejected the role that Nick Bowles was trying to foist on them. I mean, there are many, many Labour MPs that, uh, well, I say many, yeah. I've probably talked to uh, six or seven over the last 12 hours mm. since this happened. <coughs> I've seen, um, I've had reports from others who are incredibly unhappy with Jeremy Corbyn for this. Mm. They feel that he's sort of grasped defeat, defeat mm. from the jaws of victory over the last few days by doing this. So, Ali, no, business. Hmm. Um, if we're looking, it was quite interesting, I think, the sort of reaction of Sterling to what happened on Tuesday, because Sterling rose, which it usually does when it thinks that no deal is getting less likely and a deal is getting more likely. Um, you clearly weren't terribly happy with what happened in uh, this. You didn't see it's a useful stage towards uh, clearly getting a nice deal and certainty or whatever. Uh, a little press statement suggested you didn't. So what's business looking to Parliament to do? What do you think? 
I think that one of the reasons, um, it, the last couple of months have been quite, uh, and maybe it shouldn't have been a shock to a lot of business groups, but I think there was a lot of surprise, if I'm com being completely honest, from the strength of um, opposition from opposition parties. Um, I think it, there was an anticipation from members, certain members of the Conservative Party that this was going to be an issue. But, uh, and I think some of the frustration has been born out of, um, you know, when you look at some of the statements that come out from different opposition parties, um, you know, Joanna talked about there being different reasons to oppose the deal, but we, we're trying to sort of clarify what it is that could be rectified and, and the reason for that is is that you know you hear statements like the lack of legal certainty and anyone who knows anything about this process knows that you can't have the legal certainty about the future relationship at this stage so you know when you had a lot of the positive reaction to um, the deal when it was first brokered you know it's interesting most of the questions that I get from members up and down the country is uh, was what are the UK and the EU going to reach a deal? There was very little anticipation that it was going to be our own domestic legislature that was going to have a problem with a withdrawal agreement. And I think most businesses understand that this is a withdrawal agreement and you can't have that certainty about the future relationship. So the question is, what's the counterfactual? How can you get that legal certainty? I mean, it's interesting that when you talk about the backstop, how could you, for example, people want the legal assurances about the future relationship? And if they can be uh, obtained, great. I mean, if they can find ways to iron out the um, issues with the backstop, fine. We would like the deal to get through, period, so they could move on to the next stage. And I think it's uh, the frustration has been bored out of different uh, viewpoints that we've heard that sometimes don't take account of what the reality of this is. And I know that there is an argument to say that Parliament, there's no majority in Parliament for no deal, but you have to also remember that Article 50 says that two years after that trigger date, the treaties fall away. So you have to actually, you can't just anticipate that the EU is going to decide at the last minute to come and save the UK and, and offer to extend it if we haven't asked for it at that point. So it's not just a question about who gets to initiate it or not, or whether there's a majority in Parliament, it's also what Article 50 dictates to a certain extent. Um, and, you know, it, it was, it was the least bad option and in the absence of anything else and the fact that there is this pessimism about consensus building seems to reinforce even though we'd like to now move on from the fact that that deal was voted down, how do we get consensus going forward, the fact that there is that pessimism about consensus is exactly why people were frustrated about the deal being voted down in the first place. So uh, the ex the EU committee had what I thought was quite an unreassuring hearing with the Minister for No Deal Preparations from uh, from DexEU last week, Chris Heaton Harris, who pointed out that actually the bulk of the heavy lifting was being done in departments and therefore he couldn't answer a lot of the MPs' questions, but did often to write quite a lot of time, as we noted, to the committee. Um, you know, people say actually no deal planning is going better than expected, it's now intensifying, we've got these 4,000 extra civil servants mm -hmm. being drafted across from departments who aren't doing very much on Brexit to departments that mm -hmm. are. So what do you think, Ali, looking from the, from the members, do you think the state of no deal planning is something that means we can actually contemplate a no deal exit on the 29th of March 2019 with a degree of equanimity or...? I mean, that's great, but it's not being communicated to business. Uh, quite frankly, um, we know from sort of you know if, if you are really close to civil servants, you know that all that is going on. But there is a you know um, there is a moratorium at still on the extent to which that is communicated yeah. to business. And at some point, you need to know what the new forms you're going to have to fill out on on, on day one of yeah. No Deal to a certain extent. You're going to have to know where the border control check is going to be. Um, certainly going out. Uh, that it would apply to agri-food trade, but what about coming in? Um, there's a lot of areas that the government could clarify what its intents are, but I think like so many other things at a political level, there is a nervousness about doing that because it's sort of, they don't, no one wants to give a signal about which way you're, you're headed to an extent. And if you look at just something as basic as what are our import tariffs going to be, what are those tariff lines going to be, that's, that's we think a decision is being taken, that's what we're sort of told internally, but we don't have any com sort of communication on what that's going to mean, so how can you expect people you know, there is this weird sort of, sort of uh, argument to say that business should be ready for no deal before they know what it looks like. And even though you have the certainty of knowing in certain areas what WTO rules looks like on tariffs in certain other areas, you don't know what that looks like practically. Um, and if you think about any normal trade deal, you usually have an adjustment period just for tariff phase outs for five to 10 years. Um, we don't have any of that. And, and the last thing I would say about that, because sometimes you know you get this sort of businesses name being dragged through the mud about, they're just trying to drag out the process when we talk about the length of the transition or implementation period. It's really not. It's just making sure that when those changes are agreed, what the HMRC boss said, the sort of once that point of policy certainty has been agreed, then you're giving people the time to actually adjust to those changes. It's very difficult for small companies to adjust in advance of knowing those changes. As someone said to me the other day, you know, 50% of my time is taken up with existing red tape and the rest is trying to make my business survive.
five. Come back to me when you know what the changes are going to be. Okay, let's go to some questions. I think it'd be very interesting to get views from our MPs as well about what they think about the state of government's no deal planning, whether Parliament can do anything to put more pressure on it. So let's take a, well, take a bunch of questions. We've got the roving mics. So let's go to we'll take them in groups if there's. So let's go to uh, Robert. Yeah. yeah. Um, Robert Morland. I'm a former member of the European Parliament. <coughs> And I should add, a former Conservative candidate in Wales. Um, but my simple question is the things you haven't mentioned. An election, um, a referendum, and would you agree with me that the real disaster would actually be a situation with no deal and leading to tariff increases and all that? that which I'm sure business doesn't want. So, um, Robert, I don't quite get your question. That, uh, Are these, uh, the is, so is the election or a second referendum as way forward? Yeah, let's go to John. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, John B. from The Economist. Um, I'd like to hear from our two MPs what they think about the Bowles um, let win bill and the proposal that Parliament should change its rules to take precedence so that backbench and business can take precedence over the government. I mean, whether it's a coup or a conspiracy, is it going to work and what difference will it make? Okay. Stephen, uh, these are some of your former very esteemed colleagues, former ministers. Uh, Nick Bowles, Oliver Letwin want to introduce this sort of legislation so that Parliament can briefly take control of the process and supersede the government. You know, what do you sense of the... Uh, of the mood. Do you support this move? There's, there's not a lot of enthusiasm for it amongst Conservative backbenchers at the moment, They're, and a lot of them are profoundly suspicious of it. Um, do I think, do I have some sympathy for it? I actually do have some th sympathy for it, because what is becoming patently obvious, unless something really positive emerges out of the cross-party talks, is that the government on its own is proving itself mm. incapable of delivering Brexit. Were you surprised? You know, and yeah. and, and, and yeah. you know, the, the challenge for us as, as a, you know, when Theresa May became Prime Minister in 2016, she reconfigured the Conservative mm -hmm. government, and we had a majority mm -hmm. at the time, as a Brexit delivery government. We lost the majority in 2017, mm -hmm. and a, a hope was still held out that with, by locking in the DUP, we could still be the Brexit delivery mechanism for the UK. It's become patently mm -hmm. clear that that arrangement cannot work. So I do have some sympathy for thinking outside of the box. Um, I don't know that the chairs of the liaison <laughs> committee are the people to provide a solution to the Brexit conundrum for the UK. But look, there's all kinds of different yeah. thinking going on, as it has to happen, and, and that needs to happen. You know, we are in a profoundly unique situation. To answer the question about second referendum or election, very few people want a general election. Uh, and we, we get Labour MPs. Last night, the, the no confidence vote, the number of Labour MPs would come up to us and say, for God's sake, make sure you win this vote tonight. We don't want an election <laughs> I, I, either. Uh, they don't want to see a, a Corbyn Prime Minister. Um, or second referendum, I, I just I, you know, feel to my bones that this would not be a healthy thing for the country at so many levels. And, and, and I understand Joanna's shaking her head and her nation voted very strongly to remain in the UK. <clears throat> And uh, you know, she's desperate for a, a, a second go at that referendum. But I just think it was such a, a horrible, divisive experience for the country. Um, and to, to, to run a, a referendum again, if Remain wins, but on a smaller turnout, do you really think that the, 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 the Brexiteers will say that's a legitimate outcome? Jacob rees said yesterday that they would yeah. look both at yeah. you know, whether they won, but yeah. also if it was fewer than 17.4 yeah. million people who voted yeah. you know, the other way, they would immediately say that was an legitimate referendum, but, but, not overturning the but having, said, but having said that about the second referendum, so yeah, let me be clear, I, I am opposed to it and I have opposed it, um, but I have the words ringing in my ears as I'm talking of uh, one of the EU finance ministers who I spoke to on the morning after the Salzburg summit. And uh, we, we were talking about what happens next, and he said you know, there are quite a few European ministers that he speaks to who think that eventually there will be a second referendum in the UK. Mm. Uh, and I slightly poo-pooed it and said, well, what, what makes you think that? And he said something that was kind of profoundly interesting. He said that, you know, when your body politic grinds to a halt, you will be desperate for a way out. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And 
it kind of feels that we're approaching that moment. We're not there yet. But it kind of feels that we're in that territory where the entire kind of system of Westminster government is proving itself incapable of, of <coughs> delivering on, on, a, on a referendum vote. So, John, will the, will the SNP support, mm. in Westminster support the bold let-win moves? Well, I'm a bit suspicious about it as well, and I, do, I believe that the chairs of the liaison committee, most of them weren't even consulted mm. about this idea, but I do think there will have to be cross-party working mm. to get us out of the situation. But just to get back to the second referendum, I, I, I did mention it in my answers earlier, because the SNP were the first major party to come out and say that they supported a second referendum or a people's vote, and we passed an emergency motion at our conference at the beginning of last October uh, to do so. Um, the reasons for that are really, in many ways, very pragmatic. Yes, the Scots don't really want to have to vote again, because we voted last time by a pretty Not big referendum. majority. <laughs> well, you know, we'll come to that in a minute, but... Um, it, it is in, it's in the, in the long-term interests of Scotland, <coughs> the Scottish economy, for England to remain as close to the European Union as possible. So it's in our politi political interests for England to stay in the European Union. If Scotland was already independent, then the foreign policy of an independent Scotland would be, would be like Ireland, albeit for slightly different reasons, to keep England as close to the EU as possible. So there are very good pragmatic reasons why we'd like to see the English have a second go at this. But most of all, there's a point of principle. The 2016 referendum was won on the back of, to put it politely, promises that have proved to be undeliverable. Some people would say lies, but they're definitely promises that have been proven to be undeliverable. Uh, there seems to have been quite a degree of electoral fraud of which we have only seen the tip of the iceberg so far. I strongly believe that when a referendum is won by undeliverable promises or lies, then it's perfectly legitimate uh, to rerun it. We feel very strongly about this in Scotland because in 2014, when, when uh, we voted, when Scotland voted no and Scotland voted to remain part of the United Kingdom, two central promises were made by the no campaign, that Scotland was an equal partner in the United mm. Kingdom and that the way for Scots to guarantee their EU citizenship, and I'm quoting the words of Ruth Davidson, the way for Scots to guarantee their EU citizenship was to vote to remain part of the UK. Both of those promises have been broken during the course of the Brexit process, which is why in Scotland we have a mandate to hold a second independence referendum. And I can tell people in this room quite clearly this. If Britain is exiting the European Union on the 29th of March, or at any point in the future, we will be holding a second Scottish independence referendum. And I've no doubt that we'll win it. And I'll tell you why. There's an opinion poll in the front of the Herald newspaper today in Scotland. Um, of uh, an audience sample which the Herald use regularly, which says that 56% of people in Scotland want a second independence referendum if there's Brexit. Now, I represent a constituency in Edinburgh, probably one of the most middle class seats in Scotland. Edinburgh voted, Fraser will remind me, 70, 65% 70, to remain, but Edinburgh also voted no and wanted to stay in the UK pretty strongly back in 2016. I can tell you that my constituents, many of whom work in the university and financial sector, they are furious about the mess that uh, the Tory government has got the United Kingdom into. And if it's a choice between being stuck with some ghastly right-wing Singaporeish England, for which apologies to my English friends, because I really don't think that's what England is, but it looks like some people want it to be that, or a choice of being the sort of having the sort of membership of the European Union that the Republic of Ireland enjoys, then for most Scots that'll be a bit of a no-brainer. So there, there's a big constitutional issue here for Scotland. But at the moment, the SNP at Westminster were very focused on trying to get an extension of Article 50 and trying uh, to get a second referendum. The arguments for independence aren't going to go away. They existed independently of Brexit in 2014. They, they will go on. But as I say. It, it's statesmanlike and right for the SNP to support a, a second EU referendum for reasons of principle and also for reasons of pragmatism. So if we're moving to compromises, everybody in here, one of the things that's on the table since last week, actually, and, yeah, on the table, through various evolutions of Norway, Norway for now, Norway possibly forever, Norway <laughs> plus, now rebranded as Common Market 2.0, if we're in the world of the second best, where nobody gets what they really, really want, uh, I think early on, Nicola Sturgeon was talking about, you know, Norway mm. possibly as a model. It gives you exit from the common fisheries policy, which uh, you know, is potentially a win for some people well, that, in Scotland. That's a dangerous perhaps. assumption. Well, 
that's a dangerous assumption. The Scottish government at the beginning of this whole process mm. proposed a compromise. Mm. They talked about Scotland, a, a special deal for Scotland, mm. or indeed for the whole mm. of the UK, to stay in the single market. As time went on, it became clear across the UK that we needed to stay mm. in the customs union to solve mm. the problem mm. of the Irish border. Mm. So the policy evolved to single market plus, uh, plus customs union. But to assume that we can leave or we can leave the common fisheries policy in anything but name, I think, is deeply naive. Norway's in a very different situation. You know, Norway has never been in the European mm. Union. Norway has never been in the common fisheries policy. So, that, but for Britain yeah. and Scotland yeah. uh, to leave the European Union and go into some other arrangement and expect to get out of the common fisheries policy while still having tariff-free mm. access to the market, it's just not going to happen. Mm. We saw that many of the countries that towards the end of the negotiations mm. were really, mm. really pushing o on the issues mm. of fisheries and far be it from me to agree with Scotland's most right-wing and most Brexiteering uh, Tory MP, Ross Thompson, but in this case I agree with them. If we leave the common mm. fisheries policy under any deal contemplated mm. at the moment, we'll only be leaving it in name and we'll still have to trade access to, wa uh, access to waters uh, for tariff-free access to the market. So no, the SNP are very wary of, of Norway Plus. Uh, clearly for some mm. people it's a Trojan horse uh, to lead on mm. to a Canada Plus mm. deal at some point in the future. Our primary policy is we want to remain in, in the UK, we want to remain in the European Union, we want a second referendum and we want an extension of Article 3. So if the Norway Plus sort of emerged nudged ahead. We saw this sort of war before Christmas, mm. didn't we, when the Norway Plusers and the second referendums who'd previously been sort of ex-Remainers quite together then started going at each other in quite a sort of vicious way. If Norway Plus edged ahead and clear second referendum going down, you would actually be you know, sticking there. Well, to certainly sort of, not sort of Norway Plus because Norway Plus has been devised uh, by Nick Bowles, who I have great yeah. respect for, as a compromise to try and get people to sign up to this agreement with the idea as Norway is a sort of halfway house, but opening a potential door in the future to go into a free trade agreement. So the SNP yeah. won't be supporting that. Stephen. Yeah, no, there, there, no, there, no, there, is, there is mileage in this. Um, there, there will be many Conservatives, though, who, if, if that is where the compromise deal mm. starts to edge towards, mm. there will be many Conservatives who's, who, well, the ERG will hate mm. us. Let's, let's be clear mm. about that. Um, and the, but there will be others who mm. say, well, look, there's no point in doing Brexit at all. Mm. If that's where mm. we're edging to, we will be, become the, an enormous rule taker and we will end up doing what Norway does, mm. but on a huge, even bigger scale. Norway has to go around finding mm. friendly MEPs mm. to table amendments mm. for mm. it to try to influence EU legislation. Well, that's what we will be doing, but on a much, much bigger scale. So there are huge difficulties mm. with, with Norway Plus. But the, the Conservative backbenchers I talk to, there is a lot of sympathy for it. Mm. Perhaps because they haven't really thought through all the ramifications mm. and they're desperate mm. for a lifeboat. Mm. But it is the one thing that's doing the rounds at the moment mm. that's getting more Conservative MPs and Labour MPs standing alongside each other on College Green supporting together. They're not doing that for a second referendum. Mm. Uh, they're not doing that mm. on no deal. Mm. This is the thing that is bringing most Conservative and Labour MPs together. Not most out as mm. in yeah. out the total, but yeah. you see more Labour and Tories together talking about this and other solutions. So, Ian, is that your impression? Is Norway plus sort of edging Norway for now, Norway whatever? Is that sort of emerging as a, as a realistic backbench alternative backbenchers say we can we can do this you can't promise you've been a bit useless we can find a way <coughs> forward is the Norway common market 2.0 Robert Health and Lucy Powell is that the emergent well option? I think Stephen's right superficially there are attractions to this and the main attraction is that it is probably about the only one of the different options mm. that would get a majority in the House of Commons it, it would mean um, probably that Theresa May would, would go as Prime Minister because I can't mm. see her rowing in behind it it might even mean um, that the government itself would, would have to go because that, it seems to me that over the last 24 hours the words nothing has cha changed have just dominated and you think well are these people delusional or do they not do they live in the real world that the rest of us inhabit well clearly something has changed the, the majority of 230 the biggest majority against a government motion ever and, and yet they still trot out the same tired old lines in the end there will have to be some sort of compromise. I mean, there's a picture on the wall there of Ian Paisley and Martin yeah. McGuinness. And yeah. you think, 
they came to an agreement because they had to find some sort of compromise. They were people who personally, initially, loathed each other and ended up as good friends. Are we really saying that Dominic Grieve and Jacob Rees-Mogg can't do what those two men managed to do? I mean, that, that seems to be people have got their entrenched position. No, of course it isn't. But, Ian, you are framing it in terms of the important thing being a deal that... that that, that uh, pleases both wings of the Conservative Party. I was going to say well, extreme, I but I have I a huge amount of sympathy with Dominic Grieves. But, but, but it can't just be about that. It I, has to be about way much I more totally, than that. I totally agree with you, and I think it's been an absolute outrage that the Prime Minister has not reached out mm. before now to other parties. Now, um, many people mm. will know David Davis is one of my closest friends in politics. I've, I've known him for 30 years. <coughs> Um, he regularly had meetings with people from across mm. the party divides. He had numerous meetings with Sadiq Khan, for example, who was, I, when I interviewed him on Tuesday night, he said, I had zillions of meetings with David mm. Davis. I didn't have a single one with Dominic Raab. I haven't had a single one with Stephen Barclay. Now, I suspect the same mm. is true of the SNP, where mm. David Davis did have lots yeah, of meetings with the SNP. Now, that should have been going on, but a lot of this was sort of under the radar. I mean, David got Keir Starmer a Privy Councillorship because he wanted to brief him confidentially on exactly what was going on. Have those briefings continued? Because everything is being run from a bunker in Downing Street. And we all know that, I mean, Machiavelli said that if you want, if you want to be a successful political leader, you either have to be feared or loved. Well, I'm afraid the Prime Minister is neither feared nor loved by very, virtually anybody apart from her husband. I mean, loved, not feared. <laughs> um, um, and I'm afraid when you run it, it was a bit like Gordon Brown. When you run a government in that, in that way, where people feel that they have no access to it, whether they're from the, her own party or not, inevitably you're going to come to a situation like this, where you just have to retreat into your comfort zone and pretend nothing has changed, while well, surely somewhere within Theresa May she must realise it has. So Ali, London First orig originally came out in favour of the Prime Minister deal, as a lot of business groups did, you know, as nicely gridded by number 10 that business groups would all line up in support and said, but then they've sort of given up on the Prime Minister's mm. deal, they said this is hopeless and we'll have to go for a second referendum. Do you think there's any prospect that, you know, is the IOD thinking, should we actually try to add a bit of momentum to something, that it's a Norway thing, a permanent customs union, that might command support? Or are you just sort of going to sit and say, MPs, you've created this mess, you know, sort it out? Well, I mean, on next steps, uh, we took a decision that that was something that we needed to have. So literally, we have a survey out at the moment asking about those next steps because I don't think it's right for business groups on the next yeah. steps to do that without having asked the membership. Having said that, it's quite concerning to me the amount of lumps that are being taken out uh, within, I guess you could call it a remain wing of the, the, of the House of Commons um, between the referendum and Norway. And, and I think it's actually worth clarifying that there are a lot of people in the Conservative Party who, and it'd be interesting for someone to actually poll them to say which could you, which do you prefer, which do you, which could you live with the most between a single market and the customs mm -hmm. union or a customs union. Um, but let's be clear that, that Norway plus is Norway plus a customs mm -hmm. union. Um, and there are some people who would probably that would be one step too mm -hmm. far for that. So you often hear that from people like Dan Hannan, for example. Dan's always said mm -hmm. that, you know, yes, he'd like something along the lines of Switzerland mm -hmm. first, but he can live quite happily with, with a single market, but he's absolutely fundamentally opposed to the customs union. And that's sort of an interesting question to ask is what, where do you go from that at that point? I mean, Norway is really interesting because I think I think were it not for the financial services industry, the whole of um, industry mm. would have probably gotten behind the single market. It's a little bit more of an issue for financial services. Um, and the question of the customs union, the problem is, is that, you know, Turkey is interesting mm. as an example mm. to show that you actually can, you, you have your independent capacity to, to negotiate, mm. but you are constrained in certain mm. areas. But it's quite frustrating to hear people then point to the problems with Turkey because it's not going to be like Turkey, but you won't know until you get to that point who've actually asked for it uh, at that point. Okay, let's take some more questions. I see we've got lots of people now. Uh, I'm going to go, let's go down here and let's go to Mark. So Anatole and then yeah. Maddie to Mark. Um, I'm Anatole Koletsky. I was a journalist and now I work in the financial markets. Uh, the question of whether there's any kind of majority for anyth anything Parliament, we've heard that there isn't. Uh, but maybe you're taking, we're, we're putting the cart before for the horse because what there does seem to be a clear majority for is that no deal must not happen. 
So might it make sense, I'd like to ask the parliamentarians, to start with that and rule out no deal, because that is something on which there is a majority. A, could, that, could that be the first step? And then my second question, mm. which is mm. really to Ian and Stephen, is if you actually ruled out no deal, wouldn't that make the government's and Theresa May's position much easier? Because once no deal is ruled out, that means that the ERG, as Ian says, at least significant numbers of them, would have to vote for Theresa May's deal or, or, or whatever compromised is because the alternative would be no Brexit. Wouldn't she be better off ruling out no deal? Okay, we'll hold that thought and let's go to Mark. We'll Thanks, to uh, uh, Mark Darcy uh, yeah, today in Parliament. Um, this one's aimed, I think, mostly at uh, Stephen and Ian. Um, <laughs> Uh, given that the Prime Minister seems to be locked in nothing has changed mode, I think uh, the, the next point of interest is what the Cabinet does about all this and are we perhaps heading for a point where there has to be a different leader? And here's a thought for you. If only Nixon could go to China, maybe only Govey could go to Norway? <laughs> And it was all these debates about whether Nick Bowles is really is coming, a stalking horse for whatever. John. Uh, John Saw is former diplomat, now chairman of Macro Advisory Partners. Um, uh, whether or not you support uh, a second referendum, could you give us some sense as to what you think the most sensible question would be yeah. in okay. that referendum? Good. How long have you got? That's a very nice, short, and short, uh, an easy question to ask, I think. Um, okay, let's do this first. Um, Ruling out no deal, uh, how do you rule out no deal? I'm quite interested. There's lots of people saying there's Commons majority against no deal, but how do you rule out no deal if there really is that? I mean, you know, what, what does that look like? Does it look like instant, you know, automatic revocation if there is no deal? Well, in the first instance... Automatic extension, which is the what, SNP amendment? What that looks like in the first instance is a strong statement right from the very top of government, from the Prime Minister herself, that she will not allow the UK to leave the EU at the end of March without a deal being in, in, in place. Now that, number 10 are incredibly resistant to that. My, my own instinct is that that will be the first of bits of their current position that will crack over the next few days because it's patently obvious that there is uh, a majority in Parliament waiting to act and take whatever steps it needs to take uh, through whatever mm procedures in Parliament, and there's at least one clerk in the House of Commons sat here this morning who can probably tell us a bit more about <laughs> procedures, but um, there is clearly a majority in Parliament that will act to stop Britain leaving the EU without a deal, and I suspect that the Prime Minister, well, even though they might be loath to, and it will cause incredible party management problems uh, with the ERG wing, mm. will have to make that statement. Um, just on that point, Ian is absolutely right. And when you talk about the Conservative Party in the context of Brexit, it's a misnomer. There are at least two different parties. And, at least. You know, let's be clear, the ERG is a party within a party. It's got its own briefing systems. It's got its own social media networks. It's got its own leadership. It's got its own whips. Uh, it's a highly, highly well-developed party within a party. And the idea that this issue of Brexit can be managed in a way that keeps the Conservative Party together in its current form. I'm deeply pessimistic about that. Sorry, that's slightly going off on, on a tangent. But in terms of ruling out a new deal, it needs a statement right from the very top of, of government that, uh, and there are cabinet members urging the Prime Minister to do that. There was a question about so, the this, cabinet. So, yes, do you want to come on to that? We'll do the, well, let's do it. Uh, can the cabinet survive? In is the cabinet going to move against the prime minister? We've had the uh, the ERG shot their bolt in December on the formal processes yeah, for getting rid of the leader. If the prime minister just can't bring herself to do this, uh, yeah, no, does somebody else have to do it for her? No, that's not what people are, are, are talking about. I don't. I don't get the sense. We had the the um, the confidence vote mm. in the prime minister in December, and a third of the. Uh, the, the parliamentary party, I think it was a third, voted mm. against her, mm. but she won that comfortably, mm. and that's settled mm. now for the, for the next year. The one thing the Prime Minister does have, mm. and genuinely I get this, in my own constituency and when I'm out and about mm. in other places as well, people coming up and saying, 
she has our support. She's doing a good job. Mm -hmm. I think there is a, a, a base level of goodwill and respect mm -hmm. and sympathy mm -hmm. for her at the moment. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody, any fair-minded person, believes that simply changing the face or the personality of the individual in Downing Street suddenly changes all of the mm -hmm. fundamental variables affecting this, this Brexit situation. So I don't sense that leadership is, is the issue of the moment. Ian, do you, do you agree? Do you think, can the Conservative Party survive this all? Intact. Well, the Conservative Party has been written off many times in history, so I, I think it will survive. Um, I think there may be some casualties along the way. I don't know who they would be. I don't know how many they would be. Um, but in terms of uh, where it goes from here, if you, I've never quite got this argument about sort of guaranteeing uh, against no deal, because if you don't have a deal, logic dictates that you don't have a deal. <laughs> And therefore, under the law, we leave the European Union on the 29th of March without a deal. Now, Stephen is right that I think uh, postponing Article 50 is now a much more likely thing to happen than it was last week. And that's where, as we, we've all probably agreed, um, Brexit supporting Conservative MPs might well have shot themselves in the foot yet again by voting in such numbers against the deal. Um, but if Theresa May... And we, even, even in the last couple of days, Andrea Leadsom and various other cabinet ministers have been going around the media studios saying, no, 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 so we, won't be, uh, we won't be postponing Article 50. But of course, they have to say that until they actually do. The could, it's not government policy, which is what I heard the could, prime minister say yesterday. Could Theresa May seriously stand up in the House of Commons and after all that she said, could she stand up in the House of Commons and say that and survive? Well, there can't be a confidence vote for the next year. Um, she'd have to have a pretty brass neck to do it, but let's face it, she's done it before and survived. And it is quite remarkable that she is still in her position after that vote on Tuesday. In any normal political circumstance, any Prime Minister would have almost found it... I mean, we hear a lot about the Prime Minister's sense of duty. Well. You could argue that her duty actually was to stand up at the dispatch box and box and tease this. Well, I've done my best. I've had a go. I think it's now time for someone else to take over the reins. Now you're going to clearly disagree with that. And, and if you if you say to me, well, am I proposing that? Not necessarily, because I don't have the answer as to who would be in a better position to take it forward. And that's her greatest strength, of course. Well, all I was going to say in response to that, Ian, was I think it was Boris Johnson who, who had a rugby field metaphor about if the ball ever came loose and one day he'd like to be in a position to yeah. pick it up. This is a moment where I don't think anybody really wants to get on that, yeah. that well, I, th ball. I think you saw last night that Michael Gove would relish the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the one thing, of course, the Parliament could do is to unilaterally revoke, thanks to the Whiteman case and yeah. the actions of uh, Swiss German MSPs in China and things like that. So if they could find a way to do that, yeah. which I think Don Major suggested, didn't yeah. you? Um, yeah. Yeah. Mark and speech. You explain Point that to 17.4 million people. Well, that's why I think there probably would have to be a second referendum before they revoked, because you have to, the, I think people would wonder why we'd done that without mm. some sort of democratic mandate. But to get back to so the no deal question, yeah. um, I, I think I kind of agree with Stephen that the, the ruling out of no deal has to come from the top. Mm. Uh, obviously, various mm. um, attempts like a vets amendment can mm. be done to sort of mm. add no, you know, things that will, that will make it difficult for the government to have no deal. But she's kept no deal alive for so long mm. as a as a way to blackmail people into voting for the deal. Now that she knows the deal is utterly mm. defeated, it's the time for her to rule out no deal. She may do it, I don't know. I think she is part of the problem. I think she's utterly mm. intransigent, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, but ruling out no deal is not enough, and here I agree mm. with Ian. You have to have a plan mm. for what that then means, and that, that's why I get back to we're in such a state of chassis now, to quote John O'Casey, that we need to yes, extend a state of chassis. <laughs> Oh, God, you need to bone up in your Irish literature. Um, we're in such a mess now, and there's so little time left, that we have to extend and buy some time. I say the time that's bought should be used for a second referendum. And what I hear from people in Brussels is that the European Union, the 27, they won't agree to an extension just for more faffing about. They would agree to an extension for a, a definitive event, such as a second so, Joanna, referendum. So, Joanna, you're the big second referendum advocate here. Yep. John's question, what's the, what's the question? Do I, we put Jacob I, Rees-Mogg's I, no deal, Brexit I, no, on the I table? and many others believe the question should be a choice between Theresa May's deal 
and remain no. because there is nothing else on the table. Well, this no, is there, something. There is actually, well, this is something that will have to be discussed. You know, I'm not, I'm not dictating terms here. I'm saying what I think the question do, should do be. Do you not I think, yeah. though, that anyone who voted for Brexit in the initial referendum would regard that as a rigged? question that it has been I mean mm -hmm. I'm not an advocate of a second referendum mm -hmm. but if there is to be one surely the sensible way forward is to have two questions mm -hmm. leave versus remain and then if leave wins that then you have Theresa May's deal versus no deal there's quite a lot of game theory about whether you would, I mean your alternative way of doing it would be to do it the other way around which would say how would we leave and if that's the way we leave would you like to leave or would you like to remain? It, is it? So you do I don't leave. understand that. So you decide how to leave first. Do it two rounds. Yeah. Well, hang on a second. All the evidence shows that leaving with no deal is deeply damaging and all the rubbish that people in the ERG come out, out about, about WTO, has been effectively shot down so many times. So, well, I think it has, but I mean, that's a whole different debate. But I think it would be deeply irresponsible for any government to give people, to suggest to people that they should just should just crash out. And this is where I get back to the second referendum has to be fought against a background of facts, evidence and reality, not pie in the sky. But can you really... Inevitably, yeah. I mean, you, you, you'd have obfuscation and, and, and lies the whole way through. I'm just more curious about whether what would actually what legislation for a referendum would get through Parliament because you could start off with technically, um, if you wanted to have, as, as sort of Ian was suggesting, uh, uh, the sort of deal versus no deal. Um, but then would that get through Parliament? Would that be amended through the way? I, I, I have no idea what would happen to that legislation the basic once it gets through. The we have now mm -hmm. is that we have a Parliament with 70% of MPs mm. having voted remain in a mm. country where 52% of people didn't. Now, we don't have a mandatory um, system here. MPs do have to use their judgment. They're representatives, not delegates. However, um, if, if Parliament persists in this way of going against the referendum mm. result, and we, you, you say all the lies, well, there were lies on both sides, just as there always are in election mm. campaigns. Did the SNP lie about their education policy when they were elected? We could have a good debate about that. Um, these things happen. We were lied to by the Remain side about the prospect of a European army. I mean, it's a political campaign. Let's not sort of be so too snowflakey yeah. about it. I'm not being snowflake about it. I think there were gross dis mm. dis distortions of on fact. Such, well, I mean, I'm not going to stick up for David Cameron and George Osborne woeful campaign. God help us all, if there is to be a second referendum, we have to have a proper mm. Remain campaign this time. But I'm talking about promises oh. that were made. You, you just let the cat you out, can out have of your the bag there, didn't you? Mm? A proper Remain campaign, you let the cat out of the bag there. Because that's what that's what this is all about. This is nothing to. This of course, is it's about stop Brexit. Brexit is a complete and utter disaster for the, this union. Everyone of argues that a second and referendum is like just to test the will of the people now no, as to no, whether no, they no, like no, Theresa no, no, May's no, deal. It's all I mean, about stopping Brexit. Well, I've not let the cat out of the bag. I've been quite clear about this from the beginning. I think call it a second referendum rather than the people's vote, and I say that Remain should be on the ballot paper. So there's no cat in my bag. It's been out the whole time. <laughs> I, th I think. I think there. In so many ways. It's quite. It's quite hard to find people who are convinced that the Thank referendum you, result was right who was a second referendum um, okay we've got about four minutes left so i'm going to just take some quick fire questions from anyone who is desperate to ask a final question who i haven't come to yes big it here and then that like final two questions and then somebody yeah how, how realistic do you think is it that uh, the UK will ask for an extension of Article 50 at least until the summer and, and what if, if, if then we, we happen to have no deal in place, I mean what are the areas that really need to be tackled then and during this extension? Okay. Yes. Uh, George Ferguson, former civil servant. This is probably mainly for Joanna, but um, given the, the legislation governing referenda from 2000 which says that lays out a timetable of about 14 months mm. and squeezing that is a bit of a playoff with legitimacy mm. given that our partners in europe's tolerance for extension will pretty well dry up after july at the latest what are the mechanics for getting legislation and everything else through if you uh, want to enable a, 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 a further referendum yeah. Sorry, can I just answer the last question first yeah. just because I, I sometimes think and I know this is a big stab in the dark. I sometimes think that the argument that the EU will not tolerate, uh, you know, s sort of silly kind of extensions. I think if it's clear that something is happening, even if it's not clear that the plan is that we're going to remain, um, I think that they would be more sympathetic at that point in time. I think yeah. if it, I, I honestly, I think, but but I would also mm -hmm. extend that to um, whether it was a general election. Uh, 
I think sometimes in some respects that, that, that when it comes to I think the EU sees that there is a real sort of inability. The, the EU doesn't want the UK to leave without a deal. Um, it says it talks about being prepared, etc., etc., but it doesn't want it to. So I think sometimes that argument is a little bit overblown. I think if they could see that there were things that really required a sort of pause, that they would be willing to extend it. If the, if the EU was so um, uh, bent on us not leaving without a deal, then they would agree to proper negotiations on the Irish backstop and, and opening the legal text and they show no sign of doing that. Well, I, I think there's a question mm. about what it would take to actually do that. The only problem is, is that what I think it would take to do that would not please the Conservative backbenchers. Well, all it would take to do that lines. is for them to say, yeah, we'll do it. Well, it depends on what you're talking saying, about. Well, are we talking about a time limit? A time limit? Are we talking about getting rid of it altogether? You're not going to get rid of it altogether. Could you extend the scope? I mean, you have to understand what, what are people's actual problems with the backstop? It really depends on who you're talking to. And there is a really interesting tension that, well, a tension, I don't think it's there yet, but there is a lot of the things that would, I think, ameliorate in terms of future relationship objectives, the DUP's concerns would be very upsetting to uh, some of the ERG. But there is a, an interesting alliance that's been there for a long time, so I think they've been quite good at staving that off today. That's quite interesting. Extensions, I think. Well, just on the just on the question about about yeah. how much time yeah. it would take to organise yeah. a referendum, I think the 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 Constitution Unit is at UCL. Yeah. I think they've said it would take three or four months. The People's they Vote campaign weeks, yeah. put out a paper suggesting it would take six months. Okay, there's legislation which suggests it would take 14 months. Mm. We're in a state mm. of national emergency mm. here. I think we could pass some legislation that would mm. enable it to go. You know, Parliament's mm. supreme. After all, we're sick to the back teeth of hearing about British. the supremacy of the British Parliament. The Irish yeah, Commission have 14 weeks to yes, decide the well, question. Well, yesterday, uh, in the midst of all that was going on yesterday, it was overlooked mm. that Dominic Grieve laid two presentation mm. bills mm. Uh, to pave the way for a second mm. referendum mm. with cross-party sponsorship. Mm. I'm one of the sponsors, mm. sponsored by Plaid Cymru, Lib Dems and some mm. Labour MPs. So there, there's a lot of cross-party work going on mm. in, in the background. The purpose of an extension, mm. so far as I'm concerned, would be to make time to have a second referendum. We can argue about, we can argue about the questions. Clearly, we, we will argue about them. Uh, the purpose of an extension would also be to try and prevent us from crashing out at the end of March in a state of total uh, ill uh, preparedness. Can I ask Even a question? People, uh, yeah. if, if we do leave on the 29th of March, which I accept, mm -hmm. I think is actually highly unlikely now, but if we do, the second referendum argument goes out the window then, doesn't it? There can't be, really be one, because it, it wouldn't have any effect. We've already left. Well, it depends on the circumstances in which we leave on the 29th of March. If we leave and go into a transition period, then I suppose you could have a referendum about going back in. It would be relatively easy to go back in during the transition period. But if you leave, once you've left on the 29th of March, the, op the, um, the option of unilateral revocation and staying in, in our current terms and conditions, which incidentally are a bloody good deal, that goes. So that's yeah. why there's some urgency You're basically about, talking about needing an extension of the period. Another, another reason why the RG shot themselves in Tuesday, because once yeah. we leave, it's very yeah. difficult. Stephen, to extension. Uh, Do you I, think I, this is? I think a delay to. Buy? I think a delay to Brexit is inevitable. Um, I look, to kind of keep the discussion in the real world. There is no way this House of Commons, as it's currently configured, is going to pass legislation mm. to enable a second referendum. It just isn't going. There is not a majority in the House of Commons. I may be proved wildly wrong ultimately, <laughs> but I just mm. can't see that happening at this point. Uh, I do think, um, and it will feel like quite a humiliating moment, I, I suppose, when the UK has to formally request to the mm. EU their support for extending this, this mm. process. Uh, the EU so far have been very, very clear that they're not minded to agree to that if all this is about is just providing more time for the UK to have an argument with itself. I think if this... I think, yeah. I mean, Ali, come and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but I think if they sense that there is uh, the, the makings of a compromise deal that could get through the House of Commons, I think they will be flexible and creative around allowing a bit more time for that. But in terms of a major delay to this, I think they would only do it on the basis of there being a major political event like a second referendum or a general election. Um, on the Irish backstop issue, I don't get any sense at all that there's any appetite on the EU side for budging on that. Uh, one of the Irish government ministers rang me on Sunday night just to talk about what was mm. going to unfold this week, and he said to me that they have been delighted. They couldn't have asked for better support from the European Commission on, on, on this. Uh, what we hear on the EU side, and Joanna and I go across and meet with Barnier and his mm. people from, from time to time as part of the committee, they are very comfortable with the support that they are giving 
the, the Irish government. Yeah. That, that seems to be, be absolutely solid. So, Ali, final, final question to you. We keep on hearing that ultimately the people that will force more flexibility out of the EU is business pressure on member state governments. That's been the sort of cavalry that stayed the wrong side of the hill throughout the entire process. Do you, from any of your sort of contacts in Europe, get any sense that governments there are feeling any pressure from business to sort of, you know, do something that's going to accommodate and, and avoid the potential for a no deal? If we see sort of things like the backstop and stuff like that are really tipping the UK towards this no deal, do you get any sense that business out there is saying, for God's sake, not, just move on this? Not really, because I think the other member states have just been so much more open about preparation. Mm. The narrative mm. with, in terms of the relationship between industry and uh, member state governments has been for the last 18 months, preparation, preparation, preparation. It's, there's not a sort mm. of, there's not a, there's no sort of similar, I would argue, mm. um, uh, tradition in the way that you can really lobby for political yeah. outcomes in certain other EU member states that you have here. Um, and obviously there's an interest yeah. in business in doing that because we will be hit, uh, just, yeah. just purely on numbers, the amount of businesses hit mm. by Brexit in the UK will be bigger than, mm -hmm. than certainly by, by individual each member state. Um, the concern I have though on, on the timetable also is that we want to make sure that the timetable reflects whatever happens, giving people time to make the adjustments here. Um, and the only alternative I can see to that is, um, and I don't think it's actually contradictory, as much as we want to avoid no deal, we also want the government to be a lot far more open about what the preparation we can, you know, the, the information because right now there's sort of still a, a sort of nervousness about talking yeah. to business too much about what will look yeah. like. So in the absence, if the timetable is not moved to reflect the adjustment yeah. that we need once we have the information, then we would still want the no-deal planning to go ahead in yeah. terms of the communication to, to industry. And, and yesterday we suggested that Parliament should step up its scrutiny of government no-deal preparation to actually make sure that government really is doing what it says. Well, I think, and, I think Joanna's, telling, thing, Joanna's thing went viral, didn't it? And the, telling, uh, the, uh, telling the business freight. about it. <laughs> <laughs> the seaborne freight. Harris's performance yeah. at, that, at our select committee was appalling. He actually said, when asked why extra police were being mm. sent to Northern Ireland, he told us it was for the marching season. That's yes. what he said to us. Now, you've got a fool like that in charge of no deal oh, planning. Oh, no, he, he behaved. He's, he's no, been, no, 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 I'm been, sorry. He'd been a minister it was, a matter of days. But it was, yeah. Yes, but he, if he wasn't ready to come to the committee, he should have sent someone who was. This is really, really serious <laughs> stuff. And really to insult the intelligence of the committee like that. Can, and also to be completely unable to answer the very simple questions I put to him about that seaborne freight contract. Yeah. But I just really want to say yeah. something really quickly. Yeah. There, there could be a majority yeah. in Parliament for a second vote mm. if Corbyn swings behind it and whips his Labour uh, MPs. Uh, oh. It's a big if. But, but, but momentum, look, I've got lots mm. of friends in the Labour yeah. Party. I used to be mm. a member of the Labour Party. I, I understand yeah. a bit about how they work. Mm. There's going to be a lot of pressure for momentum. Mm on them to do that because strangely, although much as they Corbyn love Corbyn, they that, also love the idea of a second if vote. If Corbyn does that, there will be resignations from his front bench. I'm sure there will. Well, that's not much of a change from the usual position. <laughs> okay, right. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to call a halt there because yeah. uh, we promised people it would end at 9.45 and we didn't request a formal extension. So <laughs> I absolutely need to bring things to a halt because, you know, the UK can't meet its deadlines anymore. So. Very many thanks to my panel for giving us such sort of interesting, <laughs> in, insights into what's going on. Please keep in touch with what we're doing on our Brexit pages. Let us know if we're not answering any of your questions. And uh, we'll regroup in very sh short uh, time to discuss further. Thank you.